Jennifer. Welcome to my channel and thanks for hanging out with me. I am back for another little fireside chat here about writing, which when I resuscitated this channel recently, uh, deciding that I would take it in a new direction um, where I am pretty much opening myself up to talking about whatever I want to talk about and not leaving it strictly to my stories and writing in general, I found myself realizing, well, I actually do want to talk about my writing. And I think that's great because I, I am in a bit of a hiatus with that, uh, focusing more on editing at the moment. And in the meantime, my creativity, I'm able to find an outlet for it through editing for others. And then also in my explorations of the metaphysical and learning about different divination techniques like tarot and oracle and runes and geomancy and whatnot. And so you can find videos on that on my channel already, and there will for sure be more to come. But in the meantime, I thought, well, hey, I have been talking about tarot in my videos lately, and I don't want to neglect writing altogether. And so why not talk about how I used the tarot to help me write? because clearly this isn't my first writer block. And, and to be clear, I actually don't think I have writer's block at the moment. I'm not trying to write anything at the moment. I'm deliberately taking a break. But in the past, when I have very much been wanting to write, I have the story percolating in my head. I, I, I know what I want to do generally and where I want to go with it, but then actually sitting at the computer ugh, just doesn't come. And so if I were to give any writing advice, I would first of all say, don't sit at the computer when first coming up with a story idea. I find that my ideas flow best when I go old school pen to paper. This is but one of several journals that I have where I just scribble. Um, and I have just loaded these journals with chicken scratchings, even pictures. I should talk about this sometime. I actually did a little schematic for my murder mystery, <laughs> cocktails and cocktails. I'll, I'll, I'll do a little fireside chat about that one sometime and what my brainstorming process for that was like and why I ended up doing me drawings for that but um at any rate there's something about pen to paper that does dislodge the ideas i find i know i'm not the only one to say that too but you know whatever works people have to do what works for them i have by no means an end all be all authority and i don't think that anyone is even the writers that you see out there with great success they find their own way to it. And so for anyone who's looking to get into it, that would be my main word of encouragement is just, you know, finding your own voice through it in your own way. And so for me personally, sometimes just staring at the computer screen and tap, tap, tapping things out, um, it can be kind of stale. And so I think it's also the fact that I can hand write and having that continuous flow of the stroke of the pen or pencil, it encourages me more to free write where I'm not thinking so much about constructing complete sentences or even effective sentences. You know, if I'm just in the drafting phase, I'm not writing the story yet. I'm just brainstorming the plot points and the characters and trying to flesh all of that out to give me the direction that I need for when I do ultimately sit at the computer and start writing out the words that are ultimately going to be in print. So, not to belabor that subject, but stemming from that, uh, this has always been my process from the very beginning when I first started writing. I mean, even when I was back in school and brainstorming ideas for creative writing or one of my English teachers, I remember, I think it was my sophomore year in high school, she would have us uh, write in a notebook, spiral notebook specifically designated to be our free writing journals and I don't remember if she had us do it for a few minutes a day or maybe it was even just once a week I honestly can't recall I hope I have that journal somewhere at my parents house 
But in any case, you know, it maybe be five minutes and she'd say, don't lift the tip of your pen or pencil from that paper. Just keep writing. And if you are stuck on what to say, just write stuck, 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 stuck. Just whatever's in your head, just keep writing something. And so I do credit Mrs. Morrison, my English teacher, for getting me into that as a consistent practice because it is certainly something that I still do. And I know I babbled about this in my last ramble, I believe, about how I can get to in my own head and I need to get better at just doing the bleh and just writing and just letting the ideas flow. And so um, this is all part and parcel of that. But even so, sometimes that doesn't even quite go. If there's just something that's not like inspiring me or in this case in particular, when I started using tarot specifically to help me write. I had agreed to contribute a short story to an anthology. So there was a theme for the anthology and basically up to that point, well, I had written to themes before, I should say. You know, I had I I remember when I was first looking to get published, I would look online for short story contests and sometimes they would have a theme and I would write to that. So then I could submit something in the hopes of placing if not winning and whether the prize was to be published in some sort of publication or just to have the accolades that I could put on a query letter when I was submitting my manuscript to agents or publishers. Uh, yeah, so there were times I sort of wrote on demand in that way. It was my own choice to do it, but the theme was not of my own choosing. So this was a similar case where I was invited into this anthology, which of course I wanna do that. It's really cool to collaborate with other authors on that, even when you're, not involved in the writing of each other's stories, just the idea that you're all pitching in for this common goal. And the anthology was for charity, for the World Literacy Foundation. And so it just feels good knowing that you're all banding together for a cause. And it also helps too with, uh, I have said it in an earlier video, I suck at self-promotion. <laughs> so to have others involved who are also promoting the same collection was helpful and everyone can bring their own readers to the table and so I guess that would be another piece of advice that I could give to someone who might be fairly new to writing if you're interested in writing a shorter story um, and if there is a way to get involved with a group of other writers to put out an anthology. It doesn't have to have a theme necessarily but it is fun if it does. And then you just have everyone bringing their own talents in writing and marketing and their own readership to the table. And it's nice. Then you don't feel like you're so much in isolation because it can be a very solitary task, which is also a wonderful aspect of it. But, you know, change things up. So, yeah, I'm going off on a lot of tangents, but my point <laughs> was that i had been invited to do this anthology, which I actually have sitting right next to me. This is Paperback Writers. Uh, this is no longer in print. It was not intended to stay um, out there for long, just maybe about a year. Proceeds going to the World Literacy Foundation, but it's inspired by the music of the Beatles, universal, romantic, experimental, timeless, emotional, fearless, 11 short stories that all share a chord. So the theme, as you just heard, was the Beatles. And just to be given sort of a topic in general can be daunting as a writer because it's not like it's something that came of my own inspiration. And it wasn't in my own time either. There was a specific time frame for getting these stories completed and it needed to touch on the Beatles in some way. In whatever way we wanted to do it, it could just be a reference slipped in, it could be more largely about them, like if the plot incorporates someone maybe who's a big Beatles fan or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of different avenues that you could take with it. 
So I found myself challenged just because I, that idea of like having to write on demand, it's not a strength of mine. And also the Beatles, I like them. I'm not like a super fanatic over them though. You know, if I were to organize authors in an anthology, I wouldn't be choosing the Beatles as the theme is all I'm saying. Um, but otherwise, yeah, they're, they're great. They're phenomenal. I just, I, I think if I were doing an anthology like this, I would probably go with The Cure. And now that I'm thinking about that, it almost makes me want to do a short story collection of my own. It's all stories inspired by The Cure in some way. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna duly note and document that one, folks. Um, that's a fun idea to tuck away for a future collection in any case. <laughs> but as I was trying to think like, okay, how can I, how can I get excited about this story? Because otherwise I don't want to write unless I can get excited about what's the elements of the story, what it's about, if there's anything that I need to research, if my mind needs to be delving into that story world for a significant period of time. I have to love what I'm writing about. And so I was kind of daunted because I'm like, oh, I'm coming from a place of like, not love for the Beatles. How could I get more interested in this? And then I realized, oh, Revolver. I love the Beatles Revolver album. That's like the one that I bought for myself years ago. And some of my favorite songs of theirs are on it. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna latch on to that. So Revolver. And that is why my story in this anthology is called Revolve Her with a female protagonist and I won't get into the whole nitty gritty of that story. I will leave a link to its current home. Because this is no longer in print, I got the rights back and ended up doing a short story collection, Myths, Mothers and Mystics. And so I've got that this story that I felt daunted about and I didn't know if I was gonna be able to squeeze anything out of my head for it, ended up being a proper novella. It was it was long, It's I think it was at least 20,000 words, which for a short story is a long short story. So that ended up uh, becoming the big anchor of this short story collection. So how did I go from uh, stuck and not having an idea of where to go and having the pressure of a deadline and having writer's block. And my niece, she told me or suggested, knowing that I was getting really into tarot at the time, you should use tarot to write a story. If you're stuck, like pull the cards out and see what they tell you to write about. And I was like, yeah, 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 that's a cool idea. That's a cool idea. But I, did, I don't know. I didn't know if I was really going to try it for something serious. But then when I found myself like really committed to this story and especially owing it to other people, you know, it's not like it's just something to do for my own fancy. I mean, if I have a story idea and I end up putzing on it, fine. I'm not, I'm not keeping anyone waiting other than myself. But for this, I had people counting on me. It needed to be written. And so I thought, you know what? I am gonna try it. I don't really know how to approach that process, but why not just give it a go? Thirsty. So, in the process of learning more about tarot at the time, this was um, several years ago, I, of course, in the tarot tube community, stumble upon Ethany. And she was sharing a story tarot spread, sort of as a technique for getting better at reading tarot. If you look at interpreting a spread more in terms of creating a narrative through the cards. So she created this spread that would help lend itself to being more like a story where you could see characterization and you could see conflict and it does just sort of help 
pull separate cards together when you understand those types of elements and you understand the elements of story, it does help with looking at that bird's eye view and coming up with a storyline to accompany it. And so not only is that just a great technique for learning how to read and interpret spreads, but I thought I'm gonna actually use the story tarot spread to write a damn story. So what I decided to do, because I was writing a ghost story, I knew that much. Because again, I have to love it. And that's what I tend to be really into. I like it to be a little bit haunted. So I went to one of my first decks here. Very early deck. Tarot of Haunted House. The Sasha Graham deck. A lot of people these days are probably very familiar with Sasha Graham's Dark Wood Tarot, which is also a really cool one. I shockingly rehomed that recently. I really I stunned myself with that one because I immediately loved that deck and I had used it for a reading for someone else very recently and like a very deep, <laughs> um, powerful reading. And I don't know what it was, just something about it afterwards. I was like. I'm done. It, 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 I don't know. When it's coarse, that was it. And yeah. So anyway, meanwhile, this one that I had for much longer, I'm like, I'm never getting rid of this one. And I don't, I don't know why. Because I love, in the Darkwood Tarot, Abigail Larson, the artist on that project. Her artwork is so beautiful. That absolutely resonates with me. Everything about that deck was very me. But I just, um, I don't know what it was. So... Oh, uh, Mirko, oh my gosh. I can't even read. <laughs> and now I can read, but I can't pronounce. Mirko Pier Federici? Mirko Pier Federici? <laughs> I could try a third time, but I feel like it's not gonna be three times the charm. <laughs> I think though that this Mirko is a um, maybe a graphic novelist, illustrations for comics and graphic novels and such. And you can tell when you look at these cards. Oh, sorry for the glare. Oh, I'm leaving this one out for a funny story to tell later. But yeah, so you can just see these very dramatic scenes. This is the butler welcoming us to the haunted house, which is an old manor of sorts. And well, I guess my reason for grabbing this deck for the story spread was twofold because one, it had this haunting element to it and I wanna write a haunting story. So I thought like atmospherically, it would help me get in that headspace. But also, it tells a story. And, and, and those, again, who have used the Dark Wood Tarot know how Sasha Graham has a storyline. There's a protagonist that moves through the major arcana and even the minors in this case. And so it's cool. Like it just, it sets up this whole world. So there's this whole haunted mansion and... It's filled with angels and demons and occultists and just, yeah, it's cool. And so this woman in the pink dress is our protagonist here. But yeah, isn't that, it's just lovely. So you can tell it's very Rider Waite Smith. Ooh, the love all is quite, quite the saucy. But yeah, I mean, this is a very RWS style. And so if you like RWS and you like the style of this art and the haunted quality of it, I highly recommend it. Like I said, I, I, this is one I just, I, I, I really love it. I just know I'm always going to keep it. Even though I don't use it too much, I mainly pull it out around. Getting into like late September, October as we approach Halloween. 
So I chose that deck to initiate my tarot inquiries and getting into the story and understanding what I was going to do with it. So, you know, the one thing I had figured out for this Beatles themed story that I was going to draw elements of Revolver and just to get that bit aside uh, and I can talk more about this particular story at a future time, but I ended up I did not, I might have made a couple of overt Beatles references in it, but I ended up paraphrasing lyrics from songs in the album that like someone who really knew the songs would pick up on. And I, I just interwove that into the actual narrative and dialogue of the story. And that was actually kind of like another way of writing my way into the story as well, because sometimes the lyric would prompt an idea of what could be happening at that moment or at a future time. And so I use that as a guide as well. And I've done that before with poems and nursery rhymes. And so, yes, the more I think about this, I, I, I see another video in my future not just about this story, but the way I have used other literature or lyrics to get ideas. So another one, another idea to tuck away there. You as my witness. But for this one, um, yeah, it, 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 there's just it's filled with Easter eggs with those lyrics through it. But for the tarot spread specifically, trying to get myself back on topic here, it's a six card spread. You have the significator. And for that, I think I just shuffled all of the court cards and then laid one down to see who's my protagonist. Even if I had a general idea. So maybe I had even chosen who it would be and certain traits, this was at least going to help me flesh it out further, like who this person would really be at the core. So, you know, gender was irrelevant if it ended up being a queen or a king. I, you know, it, it didn't have to do with that so much as just like the spirit of the person and their temperament, uh, their mindset of the world and so on and so forth. And so the first card is drawing that significator. So in my case, that's how I was choosing my protagonist. Number two uh, is the protagonist's challenge that they must face. The third card is an opportunity presented to them. Number four is their environment, so to get an idea of setting. Number five, the reward. So it is always nice if you see a character overcoming their challenges. What do they get out of it? Throw them a little something. And six, the final card is the outcome. So going into this story and into this story spread as well, I did already have a few elements in mind that I knew I wanted to factor into the story. So I, I wasn't doing the tarot reading, just going into it blindly, having no clue what the story was be, going to be about. You know, I had I had chosen the Revolver album by the Beatles as being the way that I was going to incorporate this Beatles theme for the sake of the anthology. And I had just recently visited Sedona, Arizona and thought that that would make a beautiful backdrop for a story someday. So I thought, well, why not this one? And I just loved the whole vortex vibe of it, the energy lines that they say run through it. There were crystal shops and just this whole new age energy about it in addition to just spectacular views, those red rocks, those outcroppings. And it just, it was a wonderful atmosphere for feeling connected with nature and seemed a great opportunity for connecting with oneself. And so I pictured this character, my protagonist Ellie, as coming from somewhere more urban and because I live in London, I had her come from London where it's very gray and rainy and then all of a sudden to be thrust into this hot, dry, sunny climate. 
how she would have this chance to feel like she was in completely alien territory, just something really unknown to her. And given the conflicts that she has to overcome, it would be a chance for self-discovery by peeling away the layers of what was familiar to her and sort of forcing her to really know herself and what she wanted ultimately. So I had this idea of her coming from London. I decided to make her a tattoo artist because I just thought that was cool. And I could see the tattoos all up and down her arms. And there was this one amazing metaphysical shop huge that I had visited and there were apparently psychics upstairs that you could consult and I decided okay I'm going to have my tattoo artist protagonist come to this shop at some point and want to talk to someone whether just for fun or because she really thinks she needs to talk to someone and this is the best avenue for lack of knowing anyone else in town and so going into the story, I knew that there would be her and that a strong secondary character would be this medium that she meets. And also before I get into this actual tarot of spread, I had not, in fact, in this case, shuffled the court cards in order to draw one at random to be the significator card. I did select one at the outset now, I recall, because of the release date of the Revolver album, I thought one of my Easter eggs, nods to that, would be making this character's birthday the same date. And so that was in August. And so I chose the Queen of Wands for the fire element. Because it was August, Leo? I'm not great at astrology, but I, I, think, I think it's Leo. So I set this at the top to anchor the reading. And then for the second card, my protagonist's challenge, I drew the moon reversed. Because I do read reversals, not all of the time, but some of the time, yeah. But for the moon, what I briefly jotted then in my journal was fear, deception, disillusionment. She's lost and depressed and letting doubt get the better of her. I definitely went shadowy because of the reversal. Not that that can't be represented when the moon is upright as well. But sometimes when I see the moon upright, I'm inclined to see it as a very positive card about being very intuitive and tapping into your primal senses and whatnot. But being that it was reversed, I really leaned into her sort of finding herself very lost and Everything that I noted, I don't need to repeat that again, I guess. But for the third card, as her opportunity for overcoming this challenge, I drew strength. And this is one of my favorite strength cards. And I love the strength card in any deck in general because that's my birth card. But this one in particular is just so up close and intimate with this character just by herself. She's looking into her own reflection, looking into her own eyes and her expression is so subtle, but it just seems to say, I got this. And you just see a resolve in it. And so I just love that. So then as applying this to my protagonist, Ellie, I wrote, she has occasion to find inner strength as mirrored in her own reflection or the spirit or medium. So I mentioned the medium. She consults the medium in this story because she thinks she may have encountered a spirit in her hotel room in Sedona. But going on with my notes, this strength could lead her down the wrong path though. Her smile is more smirky and devious slash vengeful. So that is not what I always see when I look at this. But that doesn't matter. It's in the moment, right? 
if you read tarot, you understand that sometimes in the context of a reading or just where your mind might be at in that moment, you're going to notice certain visual elements more than others and maybe see them in different ways. And so, yeah, that little subtle expression there, I was just seeing her being kind of smirky. And so then that made me concerned, like, hmm, this character, she does have this fiery Queen of Wands energy could her ego get in the way too much? Could she get overly defensive where she ends up holding people at arm's length when maybe she should be a little bit more vulnerable? It was something for me to consider as I finally did sit and write this story. So the fourth card for her environment I got the King of Wands. So in this case, I didn't look at environment so much as setting as the energetic environment that she's in, likely influenced by people that she's interacting with or has interacted with. So I wrote for the King of Wands in this context, seductive, handsome man with the power. She is vulnerable and useless around him, or the spirit was, and this energy affects the protagonist. So Ellie thinks she's being haunted in her hotel room, and she feels perhaps it's because she's in a vulnerable place in her life at the moment because of a romantic relationship. And so this was me thinking through, is this what connects the spirit to her? and is making these paranormal incidents occur because there's an energetic connection, there's an empathetic connection between them. So I explored this as like, not just in terms of the protagonist environment, but an environment that preceded her in this other person's life that is now affecting her. Or it's the common bond they both share that's bringing them together at this intersection. So as you can see in this card, which is why it was a really great deck to do this spread with because it just, you look at these cards and you, you just do automatically fit it into a storyline and you just see this woman helpless in this man's arms and just more of that fire energy. There just seemed to be a lot of passion coming through in these cards. Number five. That card represents the reward for the protagonist. And for that, for Ellie, I drew the Five of Wands. More fire! And for that, I wrote, There is struggle and confusion that she must overcome to truly find her strength and the clarity to light her path. She must throw off the cloak that conceals the real her break free from the tangle of men. Cause that's what I saw in these cloaked, these cloaked figures could be men or women, but I think again, when you're looking at it in relation of the whole spread, coming off of image like this and drawing from it what I did, I just saw this as men further stirring up this confusion that could be causing this reversed moon energy. So got this sense of something perhaps patriarchal going on and got my gears moving as far as, okay, this might not even just be the protagonist, it could be the spirit that's affecting her. And then after this, I actually did the same spread for the secondary character that is the medium, Beverly, in my story. And some of those messages were feeding into this idea too that she would also be caught up. So it became a story where my female characters we're sort of finding themselves in these weakened positions as a result of men 
taking their power and it became a story of them needing to take their power back. And that is something that could have come to me naturally just sitting and writing it, but having these visuals and just sort of finding this focus for each of these elements and going through one at a time and then looking at it all together and, and getting this like intuitive hit of how it was all tying together. I did just get this really strong feel already from this first reading, but then definitely when I did the second reading for the medium that, yeah, that's what's going on here. There's kind of a power play and this is about women needing to reclaim their strength. Their strength. So in any case, for Ellie, the final card for her spread, just to wrap this up, is the outcome for which I drew Eight of Cups. And I noted an escape to higher ground, a more enlightened path that discards the toxic influences and habits that no longer serve her. So could there be a more beautiful card to be the outcome? Like I hadn't even written this story yet and I was just already so excited for Ellie. I was so happy for her. The things were gonna work out great for her. It was going to be for her own benefit. There could be hurt. Uh, there could be things that are hard to let go of, things that she was very emotionally attached to, things that had brought her happiness and joy maybe at one point, but it just was no longer her. And she just had, had to shed that skin and move on. And in reclaiming that strength. And so I am a very visual person. And I think that's partially why I do enjoy writing and reading because I do better reading words and writing them than I do hearing them and speaking them, as you probably know from hearing my videos, where I'm just always, um, um, and so, you know. But, you know, there's just something in um, the visual that reinforces for me too. And so especially when that's coming in a pictorial form, it's something that really guides me into the story further and I just found it effective. And so I went from this place of having some ideas, but not a ton of ideas. I had, you know, sort of the who and the where, but in a glimmer of the what, but doing this reading helped a lot gel and it gave it depth. It brought an emotional depth that I hadn't quite tapped into yet. And I will admit that's something I can struggle with sometimes when I am writing and developing characters. Giving them enough emotional depth that they're not these like two-dimensional cardboard cutout beings. This was just a more recent technique that I thought, or at least in the last few years, that I thought it's it's worth using going forward. Maybe I won't do it for every story, but for this story, it helped me. And like I said, I did do a second reading for the medium, Beverly, that appears in the story. So for her significator card, I actually wasn't sure who she was at all. And I didn't even pick out just the court cards. I just shuffled the whole deck and pulled whatever card came out was going to be the insight for who this person was. So I drew the five of pentacles and noted she is destitute working here, which was the metaphysical shop that I mentioned earlier, to make what money she can, though she has a true gift for spiritual connection and insight, has to fend off a lot of creeps and skeptics, though, that threaten this livelihood. There you go, Five of Pentacles. Very RWS, except for, it look like giant spiders. Or maybe they're even little spiders, but they just look big from the perspective, like if our view is down on the ground with them. I don't know, there's a claw there too. Kind of like a lobster claw. I don't know what these are supposed to be. Maybe there's some kind of monster, but in any case, that's where I got that sense though. Like she's got to fend off 
um, a lot of creeps in the meantime because that's just super creepy to me and just added another energy to this card of destitution. And so, yeah, I ended up using this as my significator card for Beverly, the psychic medium of my story. I wasn't even intending to go into the reading that I did for her just in the interest of time, but I'm having fun. I hope you don't mind. Okay, so in the spirit of that, Beverly's challenge then, I got Nine of Wands reversed. So I wrote in my journal, she's been through some hard knocks, but her defenses are down and she's starting to fear this will never end. The way things have been overwhelmed by what opportunities could be passing her by. What's her next step? And should she get a plane ticket out of town for a completely new start elsewhere? Just the impression I got from looking at this card and finding my way into it. So for her opportunity, I also drew the moon reversed. So same card, same positioning as for Ellie, my protagonist, except this is Beverly's opportunity, whereas it was Ellie's challenge. So connecting that in my mind, I wrote, the protagonist's challenge is the psychic's opportunity. This lost soul finds her and together they navigate the paths visible to them or not yet. So it was like a light bulb moment for me to see that. Not just, again, not just the same card, but that it was the same. So I could have interpreted this just in terms of Beverly, but to me, the connection to Ellie just seemed too strong. And so Ellie's vulnerability is what brings her to this metaphysical shop to consult with Beverly to get this reading. So hence, this becomes a positive. It's an opportunity for Beverly to help this person and in so doing help herself because they find that they are kindred spirits in a certain way. So then this is fun for me anyway, because I forgot about this. I, I'm honestly reading these notes again for the first time since I wrote this story a few years ago. And so, and looking at the cards again, and, and it's, it's just kind of neat to remember what that process was. So the fourth card, which was the environment that Beverly finds herself in, I got the Magician. All sorts of tools available to them in the crystal shop. So the crystal shop, the metaphysical shop where Beverly works. I thought of all the resources that they had on hand. You know, when you're seeing the sword and the wand and the pentacles and the cup, that the magician has in order to manifest, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they've got in arm's reach in this shop, crystals, tarot, other divination, and Beverly's psychic gifts. It's all there. It just takes them to use it and manifest real change. So then that got me thinking, okay, so beyond just Beverly being the medium at the shop, is there something else in the store that can end up being a tool? And as I'll show later on, I did another tarot reading for this story with a different deck that actually appears in the story. And that is something that Ellie finds in the shop. She has Beverly do a tarot reading for her and Beverly uses the deck that Ellie just bought. And Ellie also finds a citrine crystal that she's really drawn to in the store and kind of clutches to that as a source of strength as well. And so that's how that ended up getting incorporated but it was just fun to think of them being in this like shop filled with tools at their disposal so then fifth card 
Beverly's reward, I drew the emperor reversed. Remember what I said about the patriarchy earlier? <laughs> so accordingly, in my notes, overthrowing the patriarchy, she is vulnerable to men too. Emperor can be great. That can be a really strong, decisive, commanding, leading person or energy. But in reverse, I have to think that the card was encouraging me to look at this in shadow. And again, corresponding with the reading I had just done for Ellie, where I was getting this sense of kind of a toxic masculinity going on. And... I just felt like it was being reinforced in this reading too. So the final card for Beverly, the psychic medium, for her outcome, I drew the Four of Swords reversed. For which I wrote, getting up and out of her situation before it can snare her in its clutches for good. She's had enough time standing still and analyzing it to death. Time to rise and step out into the moonlight with our protagonist, facing fears and following intuition together. Maybe she does leave town with the protagonist or just buys a ticket and leaves it to fate, which I got from drawing a clarifying card, which I didn't dig out of the pile, but it ended up being the Wheel of Fortune. So that's where I got that idea that maybe she's just going to surrender a bit in, in, in taking action and being proactive for herself, doing so in the spirit, though, of, okay, facing things as they come. Which I guess gave me this idea that she could go to the airport and see where the next departures are headed. Standing up to men fires her up for positive change. So when I wrote the story, I believe uh, she does have a particular destination in mind that she's going to go to. So I, I ended up scrapping that idea that maybe she'd just be going to the airport and picking a place to go. But it got the wheels turning. It got me thinking about like possibilities are endless for her. And so, yeah, she could do that. But in the meantime, in overcoming her challenge and in what she's learning from Ellie, what is the best outcome for her? And that's where, as the story actually came together, I felt that a specific destination in mind was good. But she is still doing it in the spirit of sort of come what may, but just having more agency in what life throws at her and not being um, a victim to it. And so, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully you're getting the idea of how, I mean, if you're a writer, you may not use tarot and may not desire to use tarot, but I think that maybe even just looking at what those individual cards represented could be a guide for finding your way into a story. So even if you're not using um, a visual prompt like tarot, still just sitting with who is your protagonist? What is their challenge? What is their opportunity? What is their environment? Again, in terms of setting or just the people around her, what's the energetic environment? Could also be a way of looking at it and how it might be feeding into what challenges this person or creates the opportunity for them and then what's the reward if they overcome that and then what's the result of that the final outcome of the story so just sitting with those six elements is something to work with for just brainstorming a story. So you don't have to be into tarot or drawing cards and slinging them to come up with this. You can just be using that as a way to organize your own thoughts before you just are facing down a blank screen. 
and making the character more fleshed out and their circumstances. So hopefully some of you might have found this useful. Whether you are just a straight up writer, you don't read tarot, you can at least think through these six elements in brainstorming your story, getting ideas to gel together, getting more of a path in mind when you sit and start to actually spin your tail. If you are a tarot reader, but not a writer, hopefully Ethany's story spread is a value to you in helping you learn how to, or reinforce what you already know about interpreting a spread and weaving what you see into a cohesive narrative. And if you're a writer like me, who is also a tarot reader, if you haven't tried this yet, what are you waiting for? <laughs> it's really fun. If anything, it just changes up the process a bit. And like I said, I did end up going to the tarot again after these readings. Immediately after these readings with the same deck, the card that I set aside earlier, this was why, uh, I had asked just as a final question before I put the deck away and got to writing, I just asked what heat level should my story be? Because, you know, when I've written, my first story came out through a small press that was predominantly a romance publisher. And while I definitely have romantic elements in my stories, I don't write straight up romances. But I don't know, I, I've always had that just in case it could appeal to another audience as well. And it's also just what feels right for the character. And sometimes the romantic relationship could be in the best interest of my characters. It could be something that helps them through their conflicts or causes them. It has to serve a purpose in the story. I'm not just going to throw it in to satisfy fans of romance. So I guess that's where I found myself with this story. Did it necessarily need to be romantic, especially since in the readings I was getting this solid sense that these women don't have positive relationships and that's not sexy to me. <laughs> and so I found myself wondering, is this something that I'm going to delve into in an at all romantic way uh, with any sort of level of sexual tension and passion which I would try to incorporate in more positive ways but I didn't know I didn't know if it was going to be appropriate for this story so I just asked what heat level should the story be at and the card I got was I don't know, it's kind of vague, isn't it? That's the thing with tarot. Sometimes you just don't know. Sometimes it's just not clear and you just ha might have to walk away from it and come back and, and see if you have more clarity at a later time. Who am I getting? Burn, baby, burn. I could have gone real smutty with this story, I think, if I wanted to. As it is, I didn't, but I did maybe a little bit. Um, there is there is some romance in there. Um, I just didn't, you know, get overly graphic with anything. And I don't think that the tarot was telling me I needed to. I think it was just giving me permission if I wanted to go there that I was free to like explore it at whatever level I wanted to. I felt like it wasn't cautioning me like, oh no, just don't do it at all. So yeah, it's really fun to do that. So then for the same story, Revolver, I have a scene where Ellie indeed goes to the metaphysical shop and before she realizes even that she's interested in a reading, she's just found herself in this shop and is browsing around and she ends up... <laughs>